Vidhi Kalra and welcome back to my channel 5 Minute Economics where I teach economic concepts in a span of just 5 minutes. Yeah, I do know I exceed 5 minutes most of the time so don't catch me out there. So the topic for today is Keynesian Theory of Output Income and Employment Part 2. So within very last week I had come up with the first part of this particular theory and I am expecting, I'm expecting that you've already watched that. I'll attach its link in the comment section below. In this particular video I'll be talking about the significance of effective demand remedies to remove unemployment criticisms as well as the relevance of the Keynesian theory and basically you know if you watch these two particular videos you are done with the Keynesian theory of output income and employment so yeah let's get started also guys don't forget to like this video and subscribe to my channel in case you haven't already it'll really mean a lot to me and do follow me on Instagram for some fun content at 5 minute economics so moving ahead to the most crucial element of the Keynesian theory which is the effective demand so let me give you a quick recap of what actually is effective demand and why are we talking about it. So basically guys to generate output and employment in Keynesian theory we stick to effective demand like effective demand is the most important thing and this only leads to increase in employment and output. If effective demand increases employment and output increases but what is effective demand made up of? It is made up of AD and AS which is aggregate demand and aggregate supply and here in under Keynesian theory guys we are always talking about short run why I've already told you Keynes was a man who believed that in the long run we all are dead so all his analysis are short run analysis and in the short run our AS is relatively stable so on who does the onus lie the onus lies on aggregate demand so basically agar aggregate demand padega, effective demand padega, and output deployment will increase and what is aggregate demand made up of aggregate demand is again made up of consumption demand or consumption expenditure whatever you can call an investment demand or investment expenditure i've actually made two separate videos on consumption uh, function and investment function uh, i'll attach its link in the comment section in case you want to have a look at these two in detail so what happens guys that consumption and investment may be only one pill onus lies why does that happen because you know consumption gap is created and why is that created when we talk about consumption expenditure because you know when our income increases our consumption does increase right like if we are earning 10 lakhs and maybe we are spending 10 lakhs for example our consumption uh, our income reaches 20 lakhs our consumption wouldn't be 20 lakhs now maybe it might be 18 lakhs but those 2 lakhs what will we do we will save so basically that gap is created uh, under the consumption expenditure so what happens is now again the onus lies on investment expenditure so if investment expenditure will increase ad will increase effective demand will increase and output employment will increase so basically our investment expenditure or investment demand is the main driving force out here what is Keynes saying? Keynes is saying if this is left to private individuals, it will fail to generate employment. So you remember when we were talking about the classical theory, we said there is no government intervention, right? And that is why Keynes had criticized that theory so much. He said government intervention is required. At this point, when you notice that you know, when investment badani hoti hai, private individuals nahi kar sakte wo kaam. But if government steps in, government can increase investment and in short all the other things. So that is why he said that government intervention is a must. Initially, our AD was made up of C plus I. But later on, you know, when Keynes stepped in, Keynes showed us that AD should be comprising of C plus I plus G, which is the government expenditure. If government increases its expenditure, we would lead to an increase in employment and output. And you know why, like indirectly, we'll reach out there. And how can government increase its expenditure? It can increase its expenditure through fiscal policy measures. So, you know, the fiscal policy, you must have heard about it, right? Fiscal policy was created or was, you know, whatever found out was established by Keynes. So he started this concept, okay? I've also made a video on fiscal policy. I'll attach its link also in the comment section below in case you want to have a detailed look at it. So fiscal policy, mein kya hota hai, guys, basically two things should strike your mind when we talk about fiscal policy. First, the government can lower the taxes. Second, the government can increase public expenditure. So tax and public expenditure basically make up the fiscal policy. So that is how through these measures, our, uh, you know, employment and output can increase. So that is what Keynes said through introduction of G, which is government expenditure, we can achieve full employment under the Keynesian theory. So I hope you are clear with this particular part. 
So moving ahead to what I just explained to you, explaining you in a more diagrammatic graphical manner. So here is a graph guys where we have output employment on the x-axis whereas minimum expected receipts and maximum expected sales receipts which I've already touched with the part one uh, of this particular video or theory you can say. That's on the y-axis, okay? Our AS curve or ASF curve uh, line is in blue whereas our AD functions are both in red. Initially, what do we notice guys at blue at the, at the first AD curve, you know, which is comprising of C and I only, they intersect at point E. Can you clearly see the blue line, which is a 45 degree line and our AD, which starts from a little above. Why? Because even at zero level of income, we do have some consumption, right? So they intersect at point E, which is basically the equilibrium level, but we have achieved equilibrium before we have achieved full employment. So what does Keen say? He says that AD is equal to ASF at point E, which is less than full employment level. By introducing G, what is G? Government expenditure. AD shifts up and now our equilibrium is established at E1. Here our new AD, that is AD1, is equal to you know ASF at point E with E1, which is the full employment level. So what do we notice guys that when government expenditure is introduced now made a part of AD, our AD curve shifts upward. You know, we can go from here to above curve, above line, and now a new equilibrium is established at the full employment level. Can you see after a point of time, our ASF goes vertical straight line because you remember that is how it uh, reacts when it is at full employment. But now what, what we have to focus is that how do we achieve full employment in a, under Keynesian theory? Basically by increasing the government expenditure, which will push up the AD and then we achieve full employment. So I hope you are clear with that. That's what the main aim is that the shortfall is fulfilled by government expenditure. Government can build dams, roads, you know, give subsidies, reduce the taxes. They can do, you know, spend more on infrastructure. Many ways government can incur expenditure. You know, government expenditure can push up our aggregate demand. And that is why this is the whole crux of the theory of the Keynesian theory that he says that since, you know, consumption expenditure has its own limitations it is investment expenditure on whose the owners lies and investment expenditure cannot just increase by private individuals so we have to have to let government step in which will or who will actually increase the aggregate demand and further push up the output and employment in an economy so i hope you are clear with this particular diagram so now coming ahead to why do we study this Keynesian theory and what is the significance or relevance or importance of this theory. So basically even after so many years down the lane, you know, like more than 70 years, still this theory holds some validation. And why do we say so? Because, you know, to pull out an economy of a recessionary period, even now we do use fiscal measures which were advocated by Keynes back then. Secondly, the global financial meltdown or the global financial crisis of 2008, which was very famous, uh, there also we use fiscal measures to pull the economy out of that phase, recessionary phase, and more than monetary measures, fiscal measures were of use at that time. Thirdly, though rapid, institutional, behavioral, economical, a lot of changes have happened, you know, in these 70 years, but still his analysis remains valid. And lastly, guys, the shortages of aggregate demand remains the primary reason which was advocated back then by Keynes as the reason for employment, uh, unemployment, my bad, and to improve, you know, the employment, whatever Keynes has suggested still remains valid. So that is why this theory still holds some validation. So lastly, coming ahead to the criticisms of the Keynesian theory. So it's not that Keynes is criticized karta hai. Usually, actually that happens. But there are people who had criticized the Keynesian theory as well. So the number one criticism, guys, was that because, you know, Keynes always dealt in short run, he ignored the dynamic changes in the long run. And that's where people had criticized his theory on. Secondly, because in the short run, technology and capital stock were considered to be uh, constant. They cannot change in the short run, right? So it brought about a limitation to his particular theory. Thirdly, guys, his analysis focuses more on depression analysis. That is how to get an economy out of depression, you know, using fiscal measures and, you know, other things. But how does an economy deal with inflation? Uh, that hasn't been spoken about anywhere. Next, it dealt with only cyclical unemployment, which actually happens during a depressionary or recessionary phase. He ignored the other chronic types of unemployment, you know, the seasonal or the disguised unemployment, which usually happens in a developing economy. 
Next, he did not include international trade in his analysis that was completely ignored. And lastly, guys, he dealt only with a capitalist economy and ignored the socialist economy. So, you know, come what may, however good a theory you will have, you will have some people to criticize your theory. So these are a few little criticisms of this particular theory. With this, we come to an end of this particular, you know, theory, the first and the second part. I hope this video was useful for you. If it was, do like this video and subscribe to my channel. And I'll see you in the next video pretty soon.